to YouTube Bible class. I hope you had a great week last week. All right, let's get started. We're going to start with Psalm 8, 118, 24. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. I am so glad that you are here. What a beautiful day to learn about the Bible. And this is the Bible. This is God's word. Everything in this is real and it's true and it really happened. It's not pretend like some books and movies that we see. This is real. Let's sing the B-I-B-L-E. Oh, the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God. The B-I-B-L-E. Very, very good. Okay, we're going to go through our Bible facts. Now, we've been doing this almost an entire year. That's hard to believe. And now we're going 1 through 10. And so it doesn't take such a terribly long time. We're going to go through them a little quicker because I suspect that you already know most of these. All right, one finger, one God, one God who lives in heaven. Not zero, not a lot, just one. Two, one, two. There are two parts to the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament tells us how God made the world about the prophets and the kings. The New Testament tells us all about Jesus and the beginning of the church and how to live a Christian life. The Old Testament has 39 books in it, and the New Testament has 27 books in it. That means there's 66 books all together in the Bible. It's like a little library in your hand. Three fingers, one, two, three. Three Jewish fathers. Sometimes they're called patriarchs. These were the men that God spoke to in the Old Testament before his law was written down. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And Abraham was Isaac's father, and Isaac was Jacob's father. And Jacob had 12 sons and just one little girl. And his 12 sons became the 12 tribes of Israel. And they're very important throughout the Old Testament. All right, four fingers, one, two, three, four, four gospels. And gospel means good news. So the gospels tell us the good news about Jesus. And they are the first four books of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. All right, let's sing all the books of the New Testament. Are you ready? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts and the letter to the Romans. First and second Corinthians, Galatians and Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, first and second Thessalonians, first and second Timothy, Titus and Philemon, Hebrews, James, first and second Peter, first and second and third John, Jude and Revelation. Very good. All right. Five. That's your whole hand. One, two, three, four, five. Five books of the law. And these are the first five books of the Old Testament. Sometimes they're called the books of Moses because Moses wrote down God's words for him. Sometimes they're called the Pentateuch. Penta means five, like a pentagon with five sides. And Pentateuch is five books. And sometimes they're called the Torah. First five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. All right, let's sing all 39 books of the Old Testament. You ready? 
Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Great job! You just sang all 66 books of the Bible. And if you are watching this, if you will get someone to record you singing or saying the New Testament books or the Old Testament books or all of them, and you have a text it or email it or Facebook it to me, I will mail you a prize. All right, six. That's a whole hand plus one more. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six steps to salvation. Now, salvation means how we are saved from our sins. And we say from our sins and go to heaven one day. And we all want to do that. So these are the six steps to salvation. First, we have to hear with our ear. We have to hear God's word, the Bible. Number two, we have to believe it in our hearts. Believe that it's real and believe that Jesus is really God's son. Number three, you have to hear, believe, and then repent. We're going to make that U-turn, right? We're going to stop doing bad things, turn around and start going the right direction and start doing good things. And we're very sorry for those bad things that we've done. We're going to change. Number four, hear, believe, repent, confess. We're going to confess with our mouth and we're going to say out loud, I believe that Jesus is God's son. And we're going to say that out loud because we're not ashamed and we want other people to hear it. And then number five, hear, believe, repent, confess. We're going to be baptized. And when we're baptized, we have to go all the way under the water, our whole body, come all the way up just for a second. And the reason we do that is because we are copying what Jesus did. Jesus died. He was buried all the way under, and he raised back again three days later, and he was alive again. When we are baptized, we go all the way under the water, and when we come back up, all of our sins are washed away. Now, it's not magic water. You can get bathed in the bath. Bathed. You can get baptized in the baptistry at church or your bathtub or a pool or a pond, anywhere that there's water. It's not the water that's magic, but when you do that, and you make that reenactment of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, God wipes away all your sins. It's like you never did anything bad. He erases them, and you start over, and it's like you're a brand new baby, born again with no sins. And that is when you are a Christian. Now, you hear, believe, repent, confess, and are baptized, and now you're a Christian. But you can't just do that and then just keep doing whatever you want. Number six is... You have to live faithfully. That means you try your best every day to do the right thing and what God wants you to do. Number seven, five and two. Seven days of creation. God made the world in seven days. That's amazing. All right, so let's remember what they are. Day one, God made light when there was none. Day two, God made clouds in the sky so blue. Day three, God made flowers, grass, and trees. Day four, sun and moon and stars galore. Day five, God made birds and fish alive. Day six, God made animals and man that day, Adam being the first man, Eve being the first woman. And day seven, God just rested in his heaven. Seven days of creation. Number eight, eight people on the ark. Eight people were saved because they got into the ark and they did what God wanted. Noah, 
and his wife, Shem and his wife, Ham and his wife, Japheth and his wife. So it's Noah and his wife, their three sons and the three sons' wives. Now we don't know the ladies' names, and so that's why we just say wife. Eight people on the ark. Number nine, nine fruit of the spirit. Now, if you drive down the road and you see a tree that's got apples on it, well, you know it's an apple tree by its fruit. Or if you drive down the road and you see a tree with oranges on it, you know that's an orange tree because you can see its fruit. And when someone sees us in the way that we act and behave, they should be able to look at the way we act and behave and say, that person is a Christian. That person follows Jesus. And that's like our fruit. And our fruit are... Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All right, here's the last one. Whew, all of our fingers, number 10. And this is the Ten Commandments. Now, the Ten Commandments were the first law that God, God wrote down. And you can find this in Exodus chapter 20 if you want to go look. And these 10 laws were old laws. Now we're not under the old law anymore, but all of nine of these are repeated again in the New Testament, so we do have to follow them. And in the 10th one, remember the Sabbath, which we'll get to in a minute, the concept is still the same in the New Testament, and we'll talk about that. Okay, you ready? 10 commandments. Number one, God is number one. No gods before me. He is most important. Number two, don't make anything higher than God. You see how this finger is higher than this finger? That's not how it should be. We don't make any idols or graven images. Now, back then, maybe they had problems making golden cows and praying and worshiping them. We don't really have that problem today. But maybe... We make sports or school or friends or money or stuff more important than God. And that's the same thing as an idol. So no idols. Number three, this is the letter W in sign language. And so this letter W helps us to remember to watch our words. Watch and words both start with letter W. And we have to watch our words and we do not Say the Lord's name in vain. You see, God's name is holy and reverent, and we say it only when we're talking about God. We don't say God's name when we're angry or scared or upset. Watch your words. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. Number four, mama, daddy, brother, sister, go to church. Number four says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. In the Old Testament, God's special day was Saturday, called the Sabbath. Now, this is the one that's a little different in the New Testament. We don't have a Sabbath day anymore, but we worship God on Sunday. And it's still today. God wants us to remember him on Sundays, to attend worship service, to worship him. Sunday is the Lord's day. So commandment number four, remember the Sabbath. Number five. All right, this is how you say father in sign language. So, commandment number five says, honor your father and your mother. Honor your father and your mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that you may live a long life on the earth, okay? Respect your parents. You need to listen. You need to obey. You need to treat them kindly. God thinks that's very important how you treat your parents. Number five, honor your father and your mother. Number six, no killing, do not murder. We don't want to kill anybody, right? Number seven, husband and wife stay together all their life. Husband and wife all their life. Only love each other. Number eight, we are not going to steal. Thou shalt not steal. We do not take what does not belong to us. Number nine, we are not going to bear false witness. We are always going to tell the truth. So number nine, 
Don't tell things that are not true. Do not bear false witness. And number 10, we are not going to covet anyone's house or servant or animals or things. When we covet something, that means we say, oh, I wish I had what they have. Their house is better. Their car is better. Their toys are better. That's not fair. I want that. And if I can't have that, they shouldn't have that either. That's coveting. And number 10 says, thou shalt not covet your neighbor's house or anything that he has. Be happy for people for what they have. And that is number 10, the 10 commandments. Whew, that's a lot. But you know so many things about the Bible right now, and I am so proud of you. All right, let's go ahead and get started with our lesson. Okay, go ahead and get your Bibles out and turn to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel. So we're still in the Old Testament, but we're not so much in the beginning anymore. We're kind of moving on down the way. All right, so remember we talked about last week. We're still in the time of the judges, and the judges, the judge is Eli. Samson, Eli, Samuel. And Eli is the judge, and there was a lady named Hannah. She was married to a man named Elkanah. He had another wife. The other wife had babies. Hannah didn't. She wanted a baby. She prayed to God. God answered her prayer and gave her a little boy named Samuel. And remember, she promised God that if you give me this baby, I will give him back to you. And so when Samuel got old enough to leave his mama, probably three or four years old, she took him to Eli, where he was going to live with Eli and learn how to work in the temple. All right, so that's where we left off last week. All right, so now we are in 1 Samuel chapter 2, and we're going to skip on down to verse 11. So find the big black 2, and then skip down until you find the little tiny 11. The first few verses are Hannah's prayer that she prays um, after she's given Samuel up, okay? So now we are in 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 11. Then Elkanah went to his house at Ramah, but the child ministered to the Lord before Eli the priest. All right, so she has left her baby there. He's not a baby, but I mean, he's still her baby. He's like four. Left him there to learn how to be a priest and a, and a, and a judge from Eli. He's learning all about the temple work. He's learning all about God, and they went back home. You know that was very hard for his mama to do, but she kept her promise. All right, now let's look in verse 12. Now the sons of Eli were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. All right, what does corrupt mean? Well, it means rotten. They were bad, okay? They were supposed to be good. We're going to learn later they were supposed to be priests for God, but they may have worn the robes and, and, and done the things. They were really inside. They were rotten. They were bad. Now, this is really sad, isn't it? Because Eli was the priest, and he knew God, and he loved God. But somehow along the way, he did not teach that to his sons. Or they didn't listen. Or something happened along the way where good Eli has these two bad sons. All right? Let's look in verse 13. And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come with a three-pronged flesh hook in his hand while the meat was boiling. Then he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot, and the priest would take for himself all that the flesh hook brought up. So they did in Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Also, before they burned the fat, the priest servants would come and say to the man who sacrificed, Give meat for roasting to the priest, for he will not take boiled meat from you, but raw. Okay, now this goes back to like Exodus and Leviticus, where God gave the Israelites the law about their sacrifices. 
So when, remember back then, they had to sacrifice animals. They would build an altar. And then we talked about how at the tabernacle, they had that big square altar out in the front. They had the four horns and they would make the sacrifice on it. And then they would wash their hands in the water. Okay, so when the people would come up and make their sacrifices, Eli's sons were there. And they were supposed to be priests helping these people with their sacrifices and working for God. Well, what God had said was, when you sacrifice this meat, this, this animal, that was a sacrifice to God. That was for God. It was God's gift. Think about it. It's like God's present. And so what God had said was, since these people were priests, that was their job. They weren't out there being farmers or having cattle or doing things like that to, to make their own food. God said for the priests, he said, when someone makes a sacrifice to God, they make the sacrifice to God, the animal, then you're supposed to take the meat and they were supposed to cook it first, okay? And the sweet aroma would go up to God and then what was left after it was cooked. Now, I don't know if you know this, if you've ever watched your mama cook maybe a ham, not a ham, but like a roast or something, it might be this big when she puts it in the pan, but after she cooks it, it kind of shrinks down a little bit. Or if your daddy ever makes a big hamburger on the grill, it might be a big hamburger, but then after he cooks it, it shrinks up some. Well, that's what happens to meat. When you cook it, it shrinks. And so they were supposed to cook the meat first, and then after it had cooked down and it was smaller, then they were supposed to take a small portion of it to eat for themselves. Well, what they were doing is before the meat was cooked, they're just taking this big old giant, like called flesh, like a giant fork. And they're just like stabbing it in there and pulling out these huge hunks of raw meat. So they were getting like way more than they were supposed to get. They weren't getting their portion. They were getting like these huge pieces and then they're eating on it. So kind of basically they're stealing from God, if you think about it. That was supposed to be God's sacrifice to God. And they're in there like just stabbing big old greedy chunks and, and taking way more than they're supposed to do. They knew better, but they were doing it anyway because they wanted it. Okay, so that's what's going on here. All right, let's look in verse 16. And if the man said to him, they should really burn the fat first, then you may take as much as your heart desires. He would then answer them, no, but you must give it now, for if not, I will take it by force. Therefore, the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. Okay, so if somebody would come in and they would start to take the raw meat, and if that person said, hey, wait a minute now, um, you're supposed to cook this first, like they corrected him, they would say, oh, no, 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 you're not cooking that first and shrinking it down. If you don't give me that raw meat, I'm going to take it. And you can't stop me. And so they were just like greedy pigs, really, okay? And so they're just eating whatever they want. They're taking what's supposed to be God's. And so it got to where people didn't even really want to like go up there and do that because they knew that these priests were basically going to steal their meat. This was a bad thing, and God did not like it. And use the word abhorred, okay? That's a strong word. Sometimes we say hate. And I know a lot of times I tell my kids, we don't say hate. Hate's a strong word. Okay, we don't hate anybody, but we can hate sin. And God hates sin, and God hated the sin that they were doing. All right, let's look in verse 18. But Samuel ministered before the Lord, even as a child, wearing a linen ephod. Moreover, his mother used to make him a little robe and bring it to him year by year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. And Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, The Lord give you descendants from this woman for the loan that was given to the Lord. Then they would go to their own home. And the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the child Samuel grew before the Lord. Okay, so we see a contrast. It means how things are different. So we see Eli's own sons who grew up there, who watched their daddy stealing from God and being greedy pigs and, and, and doing everything wrong. And then we see Samuel 
who's ministering before the Lord. He's doing the right thing. He's learning. He's watching. He's ministering to God. And I love this little story about how his mom would come every year. So she would only get to see him once a year when she would come up. But she would come up once a year. Don't you know that was her favorite day of the year? And she'd come up and she would make him a little coat. Because she knew he was growing. He was getting bigger. So she would make him a coat and come up and visit him and give him his new coat that would fit. I'm sure they talked and they visited and then they would leave and then she'd come back the next year. And she went on to have three more sons and, and two more daughters. So it ends up Samuel has three brothers and two sisters. So God was kind to Hannah. All right, but Samuel is doing the right thing even though he's a kid. You're a kid and you can do the right thing too. You don't have to wait till you're grown up to do the right thing. And you know what? Even if the grown ups around you like these sons of Eli are doing the wrong thing, Samuel still did the right thing. So even if you're around grown-ups who are doing the wrong thing, who are sinning, you don't have to. You can still do the right thing, even though you're a kid. All right, let's look at verse 22. Now, Eli was very old, and he heard everything his sons did to all Israel, and how they lay with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So he said to them, why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all the people. No, my sons, for it is not a good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people transgress. If one man sins against another, God will judge him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? Nevertheless, they did not heed the voice of their father because the Lord desired to kill them. Okay, so... Eli hears about, oh, he's a real old man, but he hears about all this bad stuff his sons are doing. So he's fussing them. They're grown up men, but you can still get fussed by your mama and daddy, right? So he's fussing them. He's saying, what are you doing? What is going on out there? You're doing wrong. You're making these people sin. You got to stop this. Stop, stop, stop. He knows this is not going to end well. Now, did he tell them this when they were little boys and make and they just not listen to him? Or did he get so busy doing other things he forgot to tell them? I don't know. But whatever it is, his sons are bad guys. And he's fussing at him. you got to stop this. God does not like this. All right. Verse 26. And the child Samuel grew in stature and in favor with both the Lord and men. Now, I really like this verse. One, it says Samuel grew in stature. He grew up. He grew bigger. He got taller. And in favor with God and men. That means he was pleasing to God. He was learning God's word. He was praying. He was reading the scriptures. And with men. That means he was a nice guy. He was friendly. He was kind. He got along with other people. He was a good friend. Did you know there's another verse almost exactly like this in the Bible? In the New Testament, in Luke 2, 52, it says, And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. So I think it's really cool that God says the same thing about Samuel as he said about Jesus. So we know that Samuel is a good boy. He's a good man and he's trying to do the right thing. All right, now let's go to chapter three. So now we are in 1 Samuel chapter three in verse one. Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. And it came to pass at that time, while Eli was lying down in his place, and when his eyes had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, and before the lamp of God went out into the tabernacle of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down, that the Lord called Samuel. And he answered, here I am. Okay, so here we've got Eli. Now Eli's very old and his eyes are getting bad. So he can't really see well at all. Sometimes when people get older, eyesight gets bad. So here's old, old Eli and he's over here in his room with the ark. His eyes are old and he can't really see. And you've got Samuel who's still a little boy in his room and they've both gone to bed for the night. They're asleep. Well, Samuel's lying in his bed, and this voice calls him, Samuel. And he says, well, here I am. Now, who do you think Samuel thought was talking to him? 
if you were lying in your bed at night and you heard somebody call your name, you would think what? Well, it's my daddy or my mama, right? So you'd say, what? Yes. Okay. Well, that's what he thinks. He thinks it's Eli. That's the only other person there. And if somebody is calling you, it must be the other person that's there. So he says, here I am. He's thinking it's Eli. Right, let's look in verse five. So he ran to Eli and said, here I am for you called me. And Eli said, I didn't call, lie down again. And he went and lay down. All right, so Samuel hears somebody say, Samuel. So he gets up, here I am. He goes to Eli, he says, hey, you called me, what do you need? And Eli says, I didn't call you, go back to bed. Now we know who called Samuel, God, but he didn't think God's talking to him. I mean, I would never think if I heard a voice that it would be God, right? So, so okay, well, maybe I'm just hearing things or whatever. So, Samuel goes back to bed. Let's look in verse 6, the first part of verse 6. Then the Lord called yet again, Samuel. All right. He goes back to bed. He lays back down, and then he hears his name again, Samuel. What's he going to do? Let's finish out that verse, verse 6. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Eli answered, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. Okay, so God's never talked to him before. So he hears his voice and he thinks, okay. And he goes back, Eli, you calling me? He's like, no, I didn't. Go lay down. All right, let's look at the first part of verse 8. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. All right, goes back to bed. Samuel, the third time, Samuel. So what's he going to do? Go get up. Let's look at the second part of verse 8. So he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you did call me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go lie down. And it shall be if he calls you that you must say, speak Lord for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. All right, third time God calls Samuel. He thinks it's Eli. This time he's probably getting kind of frustrated. And he goes back and he says, Eli, you did call me. What, what? And then Eli realizes, oh, that must be God. So he says, okay, look, this is God. Go back to bed, lay down. And if he calls you again, if you hear your name again, then you tell God, I'm listening. And God's going to tell you something. All right, ooh, that's kind of exciting and kind of scary, isn't it? I mean, God talking to me from heaven? That's amazing. That would be so cool. And so he goes back to bed. All right. Let's look in verse 10. Now the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, speak for your servant hears. All right. This time he knows who's calling. So he obeys Eli and he, God calls him again. He says, okay, God, talk to me. I'm listening. All right, let's look in verse 11. What is God going to say to Samuel? Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. And that day I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows, because his sons made themselves vile, disgusting, and he did not restrain or stop them. And therefore, I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity, the sin of Eli's house, shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. <sighs> this is some bad news, guys. God says to Samuel, who's just a kid, here's the message. Eli's sons are bad. They are disgusting. They are doing awful things. And Eli is their daddy. He didn't stop it. Now, we know Eli fussed at him, but he didn't stop it. He could have stopped it, right? He didn't stop it. 
He says, because of this, he says, I'm going to punish Eli and his sons and their whole house. And those sacrifices, they're not going to cover them anymore. I can't forgive this anymore. Yee. Now, this is an awful, awful message. An awful thing to have to learn, especially as a little boy. All right. Let's look in verse 15. So Samuel lay down until morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, he answered, here I am. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. He lays awake all night. You ever laid awake at night, you couldn't sleep because you were thinking about something or you were worried about something? Well, that's what happens to Samuel. He didn't sleep that night because he just got this awful, awful news about Eli and his sons. And he's just laying there thinking about it. He knows he has to tell Eli because God told him to. You got to do what God says. But man, this is bad news. He does not want to do it. He does not want to say it. Now let's think about Samuel and Eli. Samuel has lived with Eli since he was a little bitty guy, probably in preschool. And he only saw his mama and daddy once a year. And so Eli was really kind of like his dad or his grandfather. He was the parent. He was the one who took care of him. He's the one who he lived with, okay? So he just got this awful news about a man that he really loves and that he cares about. And he's having to tell him this awful, awful news. He does not want to do it. But do you think he will? I think he will too. All right, let's look at verse 17. And he said, what is the word that the Lord spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. God do so to you. And more also, if you hide anything from me of all the things that he said to you. Then Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he, Eli said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Okay, so Samuel said, Eli says, all right, you got to tell me what God said. And so Samuel obeys and he does. And I bet that was the hardest thing he had ever had to do up to that point. He had to tell this man that he loves, it was like his daddy, that his, he and his sons and his house were going to be punished forever and ever because of the awful things that their, his boys did. But you know what? He did it. He did the hard thing. You know, even today, even as kids, sometimes we have to say hard things. Now, we may not get a prophecy from God, right? We have to say, oh, God is going to bring punishment on your whole house. But maybe when you're with your friends, maybe you might have to say, oh, we don't talk like that. Those are ugly words. Please don't say those words around me. Or we may have to say, Oh, I'm not allowed to watch movies like that. Maybe you're at a friend's house and they want to watch something and you know your mom and daddy don't like you to watch that. Oh, I'm not allowed to watch stuff like that. That's hard to say, isn't it? Or maybe it's hard to say, Oh, I really want to go to your house and play, but on Sunday mornings we go to church and we worship God, so I can't come today. Those are hard things to say. Or maybe when you're at school and someone's being mean to someone else, it's really hard to say, hey, hey, you stop that. Leave her alone. Leave him alone. That's not nice. To stick up for somebody who's being picked on, boy, that's hard to do, isn't it? Those are hard things to say. But if Samuel can tell Eli that terrible news, then I think that we have enough courage that we can say the hard things too. So whenever you have something hard that you need to say, you don't want to say it, I want you to think about Samuel and this terrible message that he had to deliver and think, well, if Samuel can do it, I know I can do this. All right, so he gives the hard message, and Eli says, okay, God knows best. He doesn't whine about it. He doesn't try to fight it. He just accepts it. All right, now go over to chapter 4. So now we're in 1 Samuel chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 1. 1 Samuel 4, 1. 
And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines and encamped beside Ebenezer, and the Philistines encamped at Aphek. Then the Philistines put themselves in battle array against Israel. And when they joined the battle, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men of the army in the field. And when the people had come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh to us that when it comes among us, it may save us from the hand of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. Ooh, this is not good. Okay, so now there's a battle, right? Remember that cycle of sin? Okay, so they're not obeying God, so God is sending the enemy. So the Philistines come in, they fight the Israelites, they kill 4,000 Israelites. And everybody's upset. What's going on? Why are we losing? Now they're not thinking to themselves, it's because we're doing these terrible things. They say, ooh, we know how to win. Let's go get the Ark of the Covenant and bring it with us to the battlefield. Now, hold up, time out. Whoa, 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 whoa. Remember the Ark of the Covenant was the golden box that had the Ten Commandments and the manna and Aaron's rod in it. It was covered in gold and it had the two angels over the top. And it was in the Holy of Holies where only the high priest could go in once a year. That's where God dwelt. That's where God was. I mean, this was like the Holy of Holies. This was so special. It stayed there behind the curtain. That's where it was supposed to go. Remember, it was so holy that you couldn't even touch it. They had to slip poles through these rings and carry it by the poles because they couldn't even touch it. Because it was so holy because that's where God's presence was. And they are taking this ark out there to the battlefield because they think somehow it's going to help them win. They're using it as like a lucky rabbit's foot or a lucky penny or some sort of good luck charm. That's what they're doing with God's presence. They're using it as a good luck charm. And they're bringing it out of where it's supposed to be in the tabernacle, out to the battlefield to help them win. And did you see who did it? Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas. Oh, this is bad. Now let's skip down to verse 10. Chapter 4, verse 10. So the Philistines fought, and Israel was defeated. They lost. And every man fled to his tent. There was a very great slaughter, and there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. Also, the ark of God was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. Ooh. Did that ark help them win? No, it did not. It did not, because they're using it incorrectly. It's not what the ark is for. It's not a good luck charm. And so, the Philistines beat them bad. Remember, already killed 4,000 men. Now they've killed 30,000 men. Guys, I live in the city of Destrehan. That's more people than live in the entire city of Destrehan, okay? That's like a city full of people are dead because of what they've done. And to make it worse, the enemy has now stolen and taken the Ark of the Covenant. Now, if they had left that Ark of the Covenant where it was supposed to go stay, right there in that tabernacle, that would not have happened. But they took it out of its place, and now it has been stolen. Mm. And what happened to Hophni and Phineas? They have died too. So now, the ark has been stolen and Eli's sons are dead. Why? Because they did not do what God said. They did what they wanted to do and not what God told them to do. And that's always, always, always going to end badly. All right, let's look at verse 12. 
Then a man of Benjamin ran from the battle line that same day and came to Shiloh with his clothes torn and dirt on his head. Now when he came, there was Eli sitting on a seat by the wayside, watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out. When Eli heard the noise of the outcry, he said, What does the sound of this tumult mean? And the man came quickly and told Eli, Eli was 98 years old, and his eyes were so dim that he could not see. Then the man said to Eli, I am he who came from battle, and I fled today from the battle line. And he said, What happened, my son? Okay, so here's Eli, 98 years old. Old. He's sitting on a seat under a tree, and he's blind. He cannot see what is going on. He can hear. And he can hear all these people upset and crying. And blah, 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 so he knows something bad has happened. And he's all worried about this ark. Because he knows they took it. And he knows that's not good. So he's, he's like, what's going on? Somebody tell me what is happening. So this guy's like, okay. All right. Let's look in verse 17. So the messenger answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines and there has been a great slaughter among the people. Also, your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas are dead and the ark of God has been captured. Then it happened when he made mention of the ark of God that Eli fell off the seat backward by the side of the gate and his neck was broken and he died for the man was old and heavy and he had judged Israel 40 years well it happened God said it would happen and it happened so the messenger comes up Eli says what what tell me tell me tell me the guy says well first of all the Israel I mean the Philistines have killed like 30,000 of our men so many people are dead we lost secondly your sons they're also dead. And third, they stole the Ark of the Covenant. When he hears that about the Ark of the Covenant, he's so upset, he probably just goes, oh, he falls off the back of his stool. He's 98 years old and it says he was heavy, so he's kind of fat. He falls off his stool and he falls, he breaks his neck and he dies. And so now Eli is dead and his sons are dead as well. And he had judged Israel 40 years years. It's kind of a sad ending, isn't it? That's why it's important that we always want to listen to God and do what he says. And when, as parents, we want to teach our kids what God says so they don't turn out bad like Hophni and Phinehas. Now, our song, let's sing it real quick. Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, Deborah, Gideon, Abimelech, Tola, Jair, Jephthah, Isben, Elon, Abdon, Samson, Eli, Samuel. So who is up? Who is the next person that's going to be the judge and the leader over Israel? Yep, Samuel. Now, Samuel, <laughs> whew, he's not starting off easy, is he? Because what's the first problem Samuel's going to have to deal with? The ark has been captured. So we'll have to come back later. You have to figure out what is going to go on with that. Can they get it back? How? What's, what's going to go on with that? I don't know. Well, I do know, but maybe you don't. We'll find out next week. All right. Hey, I hope you have a great 4th of July. It's going to be so much fun. I hope you get to see some fireworks, eat some good barbecue, whatever you got going on. If you're doing fireworks at your house, be super, super careful. Listen, like Samuel, to your mama and your daddy. Stay where they tell you to stand. Don't touch where they tell you not to touch because those things, they can hurt you. But if you listen, you'll be safe, right? Okay, you have a great holiday. I love you and God loves you too. Bye. <laughs>